So I'm going to start opening this debate. Hello, everyone. Thank you, Corey, Fernando, Simon, and Jamie for being here today as part of our Climate Talks. Climate Talks are a series of digital conversations about wine in a changing climate. Thank you also to everyone on the other side of the screen. I hope you are all well, holding on and getting back to a somewhat strange and new reality we are all facing and experiencing. Today, we'll be talking about the role of nature and technology in building a response to climate change in wines and vines. But before we begin, let me challenge you, all of you out there to join Port -Port Protocol's quest to bring together a network of change makers and climate solutions. This is our mission and is our way of building a collaborative and collective approach to better respond to climate change. We believe that if you share your experiences, your solutions, your lessons, and your challenges, we can tackle this emergency more promptly and efficiently. So do join us, please contact us and join us and share all you have to share with us. And before I pass on the word to Jamie, our moderator for the day, let me introduce each of our guests that represent different regions across the world. So let's start with the US. Hello, Corey. Welcome, Corey. Corey comes from Capola Winery and is um, the CEO and head winemaking. And then we have from Argentina, Fernando Buscema. He's uh, the executive director of Catena Institute of Wine, uh, the, academy re the research academy of Catena Zapata. And we have from South Africa, Simon Greer, who's the owner and viticulturist, I said it well, from Villeta Wines. And then we have from the UK, Jamie Good, a wine writer, professor, journalist, uh, and he'll be moderating this debate. And without no further ado, uh, these gentlemen bring a lot of exper expertise. So Jamie, please open the debate and thank you all once again for being here. And I'll disappear now. Jamie, you're on. So guys, um, it's really good to be with you all remotely. And I think um, what's lovely is we've got a, a spread, really a, a really big geographical spread here, um, covering two hemispheres, and, and quite a few different wine regions. And I'd like to begin this really by asking each of you in turn to um, just introduce yourselves a little bit and kind of explain what climate change or climate cha chaos has, has you know, how has that impacted what you do? Um, so if we start with Fernando. Hello, Jamie, and hello everyone on the other side of the screen. Uh, well, uh, I'm a fifth generation grape grower and winemaker. Uh, my, my family has been into wine uh, since many, many years. And, and my, my grandfather was truly the person who, who uh, introduced me to the world of wine. And especially, uh, uh, I think, thanks to him, I, I love vineyards. I have this passion for vineyards. Um, I also have the opportunity, and I think my story relates a little bit to Corey's. Uh, I attended UC Davis, and, and that's where I um, got my passion for science. Um, I'm, I'm currently the director of the Catena Institute of Wine, uh, but I'm also the winemaker of Nicolas Catena Zapata, which is our icon blend. And uh, I serve as the president of Bodega Caro, which is the joint venture of the Catena Zapata family with uh, Chateau Lafitte Rochille from Bordeaux here in Argentina. So uh, this is a, a question that I get a lot uh, from different perspectives, as a scientist, um, as a winemaker, and, and as a member of the board. And really, it's a huge challenge. And every time you face a big challenge, uh, a lot of questions uh, arise. And, and sometimes you don't have some of the answers, Sometimes you don't have most of the answers and it gets really scary. For us in Argentina, that happened around three decades ago. And I think to us, it, it became an opportunity to discover high elevation viticulture. And we have been focusing on that uh, since then for the last 30 years or so. Okay, well, we'll obviously come and talk about the, 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 the ways that you've had to, to combat these changes in a bit. But um, I'll just ask Simon. Simon, um, same question. What, what is it 
been like for you with the climate chaos? How has that impacted what you do? Okay. Firstly, I'm uh, Simon Greer, one of the family members at uh, Valera Wines in South Africa. Um, I do the viticultural side. I'm also a technophobe, so don't ask me too many um, questions that might have to do with uh, computers or things like that. Um, climate change uh, to, to me in our business means uncertainty, uncertainty and uh, extremes in the vineyards. So we have hotter weather, windier weather, colder weather, we have frost, and um, we have rainfall, uh, but normally bigger rains and less soaking rains. But the big thing about climate change is the uncertainty and what can we expect? Thank you. And Corey, um, same question to you. What's it like in Napa Valley? Thank you, uh, Simon and, and Jamie and Fernando. Uh, nice to be with you all. And Fernando, uh, a lot of parallels in our career. My, uh, I got my start with my grandfather as well. He was the viticulturist for Chateau Monalina. He was there during the Paris tasting and, and actually sourced all the fruit uh, for that. Uh, so a lot of passion, family history with wine. I went to UC Davis and have been with the Coplas now for 23 years. And it was interesting, in 1994, the Coplas decided to certify their vineyard in Napa organically. And so kind of before a lot of the movements were, were going on. And in the recent years for us, I mean, not only have we been hit with drought, which I'll be talking today and some of the things we're doing, uh, but then also the fires, you know, and just like Australia this last year and many parts of our world having to deal with fires, uh, it's been a big deal. And then the heat extremes and what we're doing to combat that. But I think for us, a lot of it is surrounding water. In California, we have just over 40 million people. It's almost twice the size of Australia. You think about that in terms of our water sources and our pools. Um, so we'll be touching on that a little bit today and uh, some of the other things. So thanks for having me. Well, that's, um, yeah, this is a really interesting issue that the deal, I mean, uh, Simon, this, you mentioned the variability. Um, in some ways, if climate change was something that was predictable, say if we were knew there was going to be a gradual, you know, shift in temperatures in a certain direction, then then in some ways you could plan for it much more easily. But when you've got the chaotic nature of these these changes, and we're seeing, you know, um, you know, it's not a consistent thing that you can work around. And I think with vi the vines, especially as we know, is so sensitive to small differences in temperature. That's why. I think it was Richard Smart coined the term that the viticulture is the canary in the coal mine of, of climate change. Um, you know, when you've made all this effort to match your site with particular varieties that work best at certain, you know, temperature um, levels, then suddenly you've got this situation where you're dealing with extreme events and unpredictability. And that must be a, a big factor in terms of, you know. So Simon, I, I'd, I'd just talk back to you and say, well, what's, what, what, what's your response uh, as, a, as a wine farm in Stellenbosch to this increased variability? Um, it's a very uh, difficult uh, problem to, to cope with. And because uh, we're never sure what exactly is going to happen. But um, knowing that it's going to be very hot or very dry, we can build dams, we've got a lot of dams on the farm. We do rainwater harvesting. We do minimum and some places no till to allow the moisture to penetrate the soil and to try and build up the organic content in the soils because the, the organic content of the soil can allow much greater penetration of, of water into the soils. And it can also uh, act as a sponge and actually retain that moisture in the soil. Um, we can put down mulches as well. And um, it's, it's a lot of small things that we can do to try and counteract the immediate effects of, of climate change. Other things that we do, we're working with an Italian company and um, we now five, five years of work 
in a specific way of pruning the vineyards. So the main aim is to fight trunk diseases. And uh, by doing that, this company, Simone and Search, um, we make small pruning wounds and less wounds, and we do a lot of suckering. But at the same time, we make the vines more robust. And also we edge the vineyards. So you can imagine a young tree, if climate uh, is uh, very extreme, a young tree would be affected by the drought very quickly. But an old tree with a massive trunk and a massive root system, it can better withstand the changes in climate. So we're trying to age our vineyards. We're trying to get uh, uniformity back. We, um, it's many years of training, so I'm not gonna try and explain it all to you, but believe me, it works. Um, yeah, there are a whole lot of other things that I might touch on later. Okay, yeah, I'm very interested in the, the, the till and no till, you know, because obviously one of the big changes we're seeing in vineyards around the world is that, um, and I think it's a welcome change, is that, that people are realizing that we might not be able to rely on herbicides for much longer because public opinion is moving greatly against them. But also there's quite convincing evidence that herbicides are doing some really bad things to the, um, to the, the, the soil microlife and the rise of the sphere and and that's going to have an impact on um on the you know the performance of the vineyard um but there's this huge debate at the moment it seems if you're not going to use herbicides how are you going to manage in the row and so a lot of people have, in france mostly organic people cultivate um but i've been speaking to quite a few people in in north america and they're saying that actually um cultivation's not a great thing for your soil microlife and they were saying that using no-till approaches actually you know, increases the soil life and then the vines are basically, basically do better in drought conditions when there's more soil, soil, soil life. And the other thing is that when there is rain, paradoxically, even though you think that, the, that having something growing there is gonna create competition with the vines, actually, actually the rainfall penetrates. And um, that's the impression I've got. What's your, your experience been like working with no-till? Um, it's, it's early days. I've been going five years now. And um, in the past, we would use cereal crops as a, as a mulch. I've now switched to using the natural weeds that we have. And um, so I use uh, <clears throat> one herbicide spray, but I also use a roller. So it's a, it's a roller with lugs on it that actually crack the stems of the plants and in that way kill them. And then we do a lot of work by hand. So it's, it's a problem in, the, in, in a lot of other countries in Europe and that, because manpower is very scarce and very expensive. In Africa, we have a, a surplus of manpower, a lot of unemployment. And so we, can, uh, we have the safety net of a lot of people that can actually um, do the weeding job for us by hand if necessary. So because of that, we can take a few risks. But what I've read from uh, research in, uh, in America with sterile crops is if you push up the organic content of the soil, which gets burnt up, as you say, if you cultivate, 1% uh, increase in organic content can push up the water holding, water retention uh, of a hectare of land by 1.3 million liters. So that's equivalent of 130 millimeters of rain that is sto stored in the soil. So I would like to get it right. Um, I'm not sure if uh, in the end it will be the correct decision, but at the moment it looks very promising. I'm also not disturbing the shallow root system on the vines because there are a lot of roots close to the surface which you normally cultivate off, those are left undisturbed. And um, yeah, and also I guess the benefit with um, the no-till approach is actually you're locking carbon up as well. And so you're sequestering carbon, locking it up there in the soil. And um, that's gonna have a, certainly a, if that was done more widely in vineyards, that would have a significant impact, I think, and from what I've read, yeah. So you mentioned um, water. So Corey, water has been an issue for you. And what's, what's your response to, 
to water both in the winery and the vineyard? Yeah, thanks, Jamie. Great question. Uh, so yeah, over the course of the last, oh, you know, it's been building with our droughts uh, here in California. We we lie a lot on our snowpack in the Sierras, and when we don't have that, it affects uh, it affects everybody. And so. Um, what we've started with in the vineyard, um, we actually have been using neutron probes uh, for, for quite some time and being able to go down about four feet and measuring the soil moisture of our vineyards. And then um, in conjunction with that, using pressure bombs and, and being able to look at the leaf content and see how the water holding capacity is, is doing. So it's made us um, a lot better and more, I, I like to say precision irrigation is, is one of the terms we like to use. And so if you think about planting, you know, a five hectare piece of, of vineyard, in the old days, you would either, you know, put in a, a irrigation above ground, you know, and that's how you would do it. In fact, we're using a lot less water now than we did in the 70s. And now you putting in drip which is great, but in terms of putting in the same ear, um, amount for every vine and the emitter, we actually can go through the vineyard through imaging um, on, at, with the grapevines and to precisely say this, this vine here, even though it's in that same block, doesn't need as much water because of the, because of the soils. And so that's one of the big things is, is it looking at each vine individually and gives us a better idea of what they of what they need. Um, so that's probably been the biggest thing in terms of overall what our industry here is is doing. Um, our primi primarily our vineyards are in Sonoma County, and Sonoma County, ninety nine percent of the vineyards in Sonoma County are now um, sustainable certified. Um, so that is a really big thing. And that's roughly, we have about 60,000 acres or 25,000 hectares. Uh, so it's a pretty big amount for our AVA. And so we've, I guess the other side of it is, is not only do we own, you know, vineyards, but then getting our growers to, to come along with us. Um, we're also seeing that, at least in the um, U.S. market, the buying habits of our consumers are really wanting to be able to feel like they're buying something that is from sustainable grapes and or um, you know organic farming, whatever that may be. And so we're kind of you know looking at not only doing what's right for the environment, but then also giving our consumers you know what they're asking for. Yeah, I'm this this whole issue of um, precision viticulture. I think is really fascinating because with I guess with any block, there'll be some blocks where the soils maybe differ and, and maybe there's a um, there's less water retention. Maybe there's some blocks have got, you know, but I, and I, and, and when I was out in New Zealand, I was going through the Marlborough region with a scientist who'd um, got one of these pressure bombs and was looking at stem water potentials. And basically he was, his, his verdict was that everyone is irrigating unnecessarily. They're, they're kind of irrigating too early because they're growers and they're, they're worried about their crops. So they're putting the water on. And so, at a certain stage in the season, the water runs out and so they can't irrigate. So they're just getting it in beforehand, which is perverse because you're building a bigger canopy and then you need more water to maintain that big canopy. It's kind of the wrong way around. And I think that precision viticulture approach and precision, precision irrigation is, is a seriously good way to go, especially for, I guess, red varieties where running deficit irrigation is better for quality. Um, yeah, so that's a that's a great point, Jamie. It's um, the old adage is, is that, you know, once, you know, May 1st hits or whatever it may be, people would just start irrigating, you know, six hours a week or whatever the, whatever their formula was. And so it's also helping growers, you know, in wineries, we train of how they think about things. Uh, we do a really extensive grower feedback. So we have about 250 growers that we work with and we sit down with them after every year after every vintage and we sit down and we show them the wine that we've made from their vineyard and then they get a report card. And a lot of that is looking at canopy management and when did you really start irrigating and did you need to? And so again, all of the, I, I always like to say that, you know, growers and, and winemakers now are a lot more in tune to, to what we're, we're looking for. And that was the biggest thing, right? Is getting everybody on the same page. And it works, you know, and, and, and in fact, in our region, you know, we've kind of had to because of our droughts uh, that we've had. I mean, we typically average 35 inches of rain a year here. 
but in the years that we've had the droughts, it's been 14 inches. And then you couple that with fires and some of the things that we're dealing with. And it's, um, you know, I think Simon, you, you had brought up the point about, you know, just creating these, these, um, mat, you know, during harvest, the unknowns, and that's, that's part of it. So Fernando, I, I'm sorry to leave you out of the conversation for so long, um, but um, I mean, I've, I've, I've been out to, to Mendoza to see what you guys have been up to and, um, and you've done an impressive amount of research, um, you know, which is, you know, and now a significant body of viticultural research. Um, so what, obviously one of the big things in Mendoza is altitude and you've been pushing the altitude higher and higher. Um, is that in response to, to um, climate change or is that in response to actually looking to get something different in the wines? Uh, well, that's really a great question, uh, Jamie. We uh, in Mendoza have a unique opportunity. We can grow grapes in uh, all five Winkler regions. So we can go from very, very cold to very, very warm. And it only takes us maybe, it's an hour drive. Uh, and, and the main driver there is, is, is elevation. Uh, the higher you go, the lower the, the mean temperature you have. So we have a unique experience growing grapes at, at, um, uh, in very warm conditions and in very cold conditions. In our case, our search was uh, in, in line with uh, our vision. Uh, we really want to make wines that can stand with the best of the world. So we needed to try almost everything. And uh, when we decided to plant uh, our Adriana vineyard that it's at uh, almost 5,000 feet of elevation, uh, there were no vineyards nearby. Uh, so we didn't have a reference for that. So we went up there looking for low temperatures. And um, everyone thought we were crazy because uh, it's in between region one and region two winter. So somewhere in between Burgundy and Bordeaux. And we wanted to plant Nalbec and Cabernet Sauvignon. So the first step was to plant Pinot Noir and Chardonnay because these are early ripening varieties and they did well. And after a couple of years at the beginning of the nineties we decided to go with Nalbec and Cabernet Sauvignon. The temperature patterns suggested that, that, that they were not going to get right. That uh, the wines would be, uh, I know, too green or, or just unripe. It didn't happen. And, and for almost th uh, 30 years now, the grapes keep ripening beautifully and the wines are, 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 are beautiful. Um, but we didn't know um, why. And, and this, uh, I agree with Simon, with, with climate change, and especially if you choose to change the climate where you're growing your, your grapes, there are a lot of uncertainties, a lot of questions. For many, many years, we've been trying to solve that question. And we understood that there is a second factor that we didn't know about at this elevation. And it's the sunlight intensity. It makes total sense. When you go hiking, you go skiing, even though uh, the temperature is, is low, you need to use some sunblock. Otherwise you get uh, your, your skin uh, all, all red. And um, we realized that because of the elevation, the, the, the atmosphere is narrower. And the atmosphere is the natural filter for sunlight. So the narrower the atmosphere, the more sunlight the, the vines would get. And, and they need to somehow, somehow survive. So they need to protect the seeds uh, inside the berries. Uh, the way they develop their own sound block is by accumulating compounds in the skin that absorb the sunlight and protecting the seed. We were fortunate that these compounds that the grapes need to accumulate are mostly uh, phenolic compounds like anthocyanins responsible for color, tannins responsible for uh, mouthfeel, aging potential, and some aroma compounds that are quite unique. Um, so what we learned is that um, some of the practices that are um, abundant in most regions in the world I would say probably 90, 90% 90 plus of the regions in the world are at sea level or very close to sea level. Uh, some practices like leaf removal. Uh, I remember we were recommended to apply leaf removal in this condition because of the low temperature. So leaf removal would help the late ripening varieties like Cabernet Sauvignon or Malbec to, to achieve full ripeness. 
And can you imagine what happened uh, with uh, some leaf removal in the cluster zone with intense sunlight? A lot of somber. Uh, so this is very important when we're trying to compare regions and use practices from different regions in the world. In our condition, we needed, we needed to redevelop a system, a viticulture system for high elevation vineyards. And, and that took us uh, a lot of time, a lot of research. But the good thing is all the scientific knowledge, we were able to transform it into practices. And um, with a group of experts here in Argentina, we put it together in uh, our own sustainability code. We have a sustainability code in Argentina. A great deal of wineries already have certified that, that code. Um, and the good thing about that is the practices that make a vineyard sustainable in high elevation viticulture are very different from the ones that you, you would apply at sea level. So we kind of have to redevelop our entire system from scratch. It's really interesting talking about, you talked about the leaf, leaf zone fruit, sorry, the fruit zone leaf removal, um, you know, and, and how that has to be adapted to different sites. Um, I was in November, I was in South Africa and I was in the Swatland, um, which is a very dry region that's been hit quite badly by um, four successive years of drought. And um, some of the people there, they're talking about, um, you know, the, the, the wisdom of the bush vine in a warm climate, because what you've got is a, is a you know, a goblet or bush vine pruning gives you this dappled light. So in a warm climate, you don't get... Um, direct sunlight on the berries but you get some and you get some airflow and also the idea that it's very water efficient and they were also talking about um anisohydric and isohydric grape varieties so obviously with grape varieties that like any plant um you know the, the the plant is making a calculation about whether to open its stomata or not because it needs to open its stomata to let the carbon dioxide in to do the photosynthesis and um and you know, if it opens it too much when it's losing water, then it's, you know, it's really bad for the plant. You know, the plant has to decide, right, I'm losing too much water, I'm gonna close my stomata. Okay, I might not get as much photosynthesis done, but at least I'm not gonna um, lose all the water that I've got. And in, a, in South Africa, there's a lot of people who've planted um, Merlot, for instance, which is a disaster. You know, using a high vertical shoot position trellis in a dry Mediterranean climate for Molo is not very water efficient at all. And the other grape that's surprising is Syrah is not very good at regulating its tomato and Syrah. So some varieties like Grenache are like pretty bomb proof. They do really well. Uh, Syrah in a, in a drought climate doesn't do so well. And so it's interesting that, that I guess by changing your viticultural approach and changing your varietal makeup uh, that, you know, you can adapt the vineyard to better suit the local region rather than, I guess a lot of new world wine regions in particular, um, started off by trying to copy what was done in Europe. And is that something you've found at all um, in any, any of you with your vineyard situation that you've had to adapt the way that you're trellising the vines or the varietal mix? Or is it something you think you might have to um, adapt to at some stage? I can so share I take our from... experience uh, yeah, in Argentina, yeah. maybe, Jamie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and it's a great question because um, the problem for us was with Malbec. Um, uh, as you probably know, uh, Malbec uh, is originally uh, from France and, and we got some, some canes probably um, from somewhere in France in, in the mid 19th century. Uh, before phylloxera hit uh, Europe. So um, we got a huge diversity of Malbec, but we didn't know how big it was until we studied it. We, we thought it was just Malbec. And um, what we found um, is today we have a, a project called the Catena Cuttings. It's the largest collection of uh, Malbec, I believe, worldwide. We have over 130 different selections of Malbec. Some of them are uh, early ripeners, uh, some of them are late ripeners, some of them accumulate sugar fast, some of them accumulate sugar very, very slowly. Uh, high acidity, low acidity, uh, fresh fruit, uh, more um, uh, spicy characters. 
um, whatever you want to find, you, you name it. It's amazing, the a huge natural diversity that, that, we, um, uh, that we get here. And the main reason is because we don't have a lot of problems with phylloxera. So all that variability that we obtained from France 150 years ago, we were able to, to keep it. So um, when we are planting a, a new vineyard or we are replacing a block, we can go back to this collection and, and pick the nail bag uh, uh, subset that adapt better uh, to this site. And, and I think that is amazing. Uh, our motto at the Catena Institute is that we use science to preserve nature. We think that nature gives us a lot of opportunities, a lot of signals, a lot of richness, and we just need to pay attention to it. We need to study what we have before we start doing uh, new things because we could have just uh, selected one or two of the good mail bags uh, or imported new clones from somewhere else and, and got rid of all this variability. Uh, we decided to keep it. And I think to us in an unpredictable world to have all these options to choose from, I think that's, that's amazing, a unique opportunity. So Corey, I mentioned earlier yeah. about water use um, and we talked about the vineyards. Could you say something about um, water use efficiency in the winery? Yeah, <clears throat> um, before I do that, I do want to just, on your question earlier, just a quick little tidbit of some of the things that we're doing in our region when we do replants. So we're looking at CAD programs to look at the row orientation so that you are putting things, you know, to succeed so that the hottest part of our day is usually around 4 p.m. So making sure that the orientation during that time, you have maximum um, you know, protection within the canopies, right? So that is, uh, that's that's been a very popular thing for all of our new plantings within the statewide is this row orientation and making sure that we're giving the vines the best opportunity to succeed. Um, in terms of your question regarding the water usage in our winery, yeah, so we are located in Sonoma County and we have a, um, when we did our remodel, Francis, uh, we put in a very large um, swimming pool and we have restaurant and we have a lot of people on property. So we see about 100,000 people a year. So we needed to put in a system to be able to manage our wastewater. And so we put in a, um, it was 10 years ago, it's called an MBR plant, which is a microbiological reactor, which processes all of our wastewater. And we use that for irrigation on our vineyards. And it, and it basically is about reclaiming 2 million gallons of water a year that goes back into our gardens. Uh, we grow all of our own vegetables for the, the restaurant, which is about six tons a year. So we, we put it back out in, into the vineyards and also our garden. So that's been a, a really great thing for us. And Simon, what, what do you do with your water? with your winery water, is there, is there something you, that you can do with it? Oh. To, to... Yeah, exactly. Um, firstly, um, we harvest rainwater. So we capture the water that falls on the roofs and uh, we direct that water into dams, which is very good quality water and can be blended with drainage water of lesser quality and then end up with maybe three or four times the volume that you catch off the roofs. The interesting thing is <clears throat> that the water that we use in our cellars is 50% of what we catch off the roof. So the cellar actually makes water, if you understand what I'm saying there. <laughs> um, we also use irrigation water for washing in the, in the cellars. So we'll do the first washes of the floors and the tanks and everything with uh, raw irrigation water. And then we only use uh, potable water after that to do the final rinsing and sterilization. And then all that water goes through a marsh and can be reused again for irrigation. But uh, our big thing is, uh, you know, climate throwing us a lot of curve balls. Uh, we, can, we can adapt in that. Um, the big question is whether we can stop it because I don't know how long we can adapt. Um, 
So there are a lot of things that we that we're trying to do now to actually stop the change, and uh, that that's also like really interesting to us. I can give you a few if you're interested. Yeah, Simon, I'd, I'd be interested. To, I mean, for instance, electricity, electricity generation, um, that, that must be something everyone's thinking about, you know, moving to um, solar or wind. Yeah, 10 years ago, we put in the biggest roof mounted solar installation in South Africa, which wasn't very big, but it was big for this country. Um, and we set a target of cutting our energy consumption by 50% in five years, which we, we did. And the reduction came 40% from solar and 60% from energy efficiencies or not using the power at all. We use a lot of electric uh, vehicles where we can. So in the past, we had the cheapest energy in the world. We have now massive increases in price. I think over the last 10 years, the price of electricity has gone up over 300%. Um, so it really pays to use less or to produce your own now. And we're no longer scared of using electricity because we've got a handle on the cost of it because we can produce our own. Uh, we've also taken a lot of the vineyards which were in marginal areas and we've rewilded them. So we've put uh, game in, we've put there's uh, natural vegetation. They uh, capture water, the water can recharge the aquifers in those um, areas. We've got about 400 heads of, of, of game here from giraffe and earlunt and zebra and all of that. We also started planting trees to uh, negate the carbon footprints of the winemaking process. So from what I'd read, we need five big trees to consume the carbon dioxide released by one ton of, of grapes being turned into wine. And planting 10,000 trees for our 2,000 tons was so easy. We quickly got to 100,000 trees. Um, then uh, we use multi-row sprayers. So we spray only every, only have to drive second row or every third row. So we save a lot of diesel, we save on a lot of compaction, we save on a lot of time, we save on a lot of tractors. Um, so we, in South Africa, we also have um, an accreditation called Integrated Production of Wine that uh, measures our impact on the environment and also on people. So everything that we do scores. So for example, if you're gonna fertilize, and you don't analyze first, you would score badly. Um, if you were going to spray for in, um, uh, in, an insecticide and you didn't monitor how many um, insects there were, you would score badly. Um, we actually 17 years ago just stopped spraying insecticides and our problems disappeared. But it doesn't mean it's going to work everywhere because our vineyards are pretty isolated here. We don't have a lot of influence from other vineyards around us. And we have a lot of natural vegetation where predators can breed and then populate our vineyards. The thing is not to go and disturb them. Um, with the trees, we've got chameleons coming back. I had a Cabernet block last year where we've probably seen 10 chameleons since I've been on the farm. We found 200 chameleons just in that one vineyard. So the clock can be turned back. Um, the big thing is we need uh, the right kind of leadership. Um, and so governments are gonna have to step in. Um, we are also not scared of carbon footprints and measuring how much carbon we release because we just take it as a measure of our waste if you can reduce your waste, you save money. So if you're gonna be fined for the amount of your carbon footprint, well, if you can reduce it, you're gonna save a lot more than you're paying as a carbon tax. And so it's a nice way of just measuring your impact. Then there are a whole lot of other things, but 
maybe I'll stop there, but it's a whole web of things. You know, in nature, there is no waste. Everything is recycled and returned and reused. Uh, we've now in the last 200 years found a system where we waste unbelievably and we don't look at how reused and um, we're in trouble. Um, we've got a cyclical system with a lot of waste being reused, but if you measure what's happening, we're getting more and more into trouble. We're not going in the right direction yet. So we've got to do something urgently. Thanks. So, um, Corey, um, how do you run your vineyards? You say earlier that you've, you farm organically. Yeah, so at our property in uh, Napa at Inglenook, we have, um, it's been certified since 1994. Um, here out in Sonoma, we're all 100% sustainable, not only in the vineyard, but also in the winery. Um, and part of that is, is that not just, and, and you know, everybody's touched on it here. Um, Simon, I love the giraffes and the zebras. We, we actually have uh, bees that we've um, implemented within our, the winery, excuse me, in our vineyards. Um, again, looking at our gardens that we do for the vegetables and for our, for our restaurant. Um, but our bee population in the US has been declining uh, for quite some time. And it is starting to get to this point where, you know, bees represent roughly 25% of every food bite that we take is, is pollinated by bee. And you know, recently we have the, these Asian bees that have landed here in Washington. And that's been a fascinating story in terms of them destroying our local beehives. Um, and so one of the things that, that researchers are, are looking at is the saying that, well, these Asian bees, these killer bees have lived in Asia for years. How do the local bees there deal with it? And they've actually adapted to fight them off by creating these heat tunnels and the bees teaming up to kill these, these hornets or these, these you know, Asian bees. And so they've been, they've adapted. And so, you know, you looked at fast forward, you know, what's gonna happen here. And so adaptation is gonna have to be, you know, a part of this because uh, ours don't have that capability. So it's a, it's a big thing. And so I think it goes back to everything that we've been talking about, um, even putting in bird uh, boxes, you know, things like that for us. We have fish friendly farming as well, looking at waterways and, and creeks. So it's a, it's a larger concept, I think, is, is everybody's touched on, and it's, um, it's very important. And is this a California-wide thing? I mean, obviously, there's some fairly big players in the Californian wine scene. You know, there's a lot of stuff, lot of stuff happening in Central Valley. Uh, are, they, are they on board with all this sort of change? Is, has there been an industry-wide shift, or is it just a few good people that are doing the right things? No, that's a good, that's a really good question. Um, it is a industry wide uh, people adopting it. I mean, if you look at our region in Sonoma County, one of the bigger players is uh, Jackson family and they farm throughout, you know, the world. Uh, and they have been a, a big leader in, in this from the farming to the, to the winery side. So once you get some big players on board, as, as you know, then the inertia really starts to move. And uh, so we're seeing that in, in California. And also, I, I was I was at a, a a conference, and Roger Bolton, the the you know he's just retired now, but he's a well well respected um, scientist, and he was talking a lot about um, um, carbon dioxide capture from fermentation because he's saying that actually, you know, that's the easiest carbon dioxide to capture. Um, has anyone here done any work with carbon dioxide capture? capture? I mean, Fernando, is that something you've had internal discussions about? Well, uh, you mentioned Roger and uh, it, it brings a lot of memories, very nice memories. He was my mentor at UC Davis and, and we, we had long discussions uh, about that. I, I'm going to go back to that in a minute, but uh, I, going back to Simon's uh, uh, zebras and Corey's uh, bees, we, we have uh, some little living organisms in our vineyard. Uh, we have bacteria and um, and uh, originally we thought, we were told that, that our soils were, were dead because of the altitude and, and the low organic matter content 
that the, the foothill vineyards have. And um, so we didn't care a lot about it, but at some point we decided we needed to know. That's, that's our approach. We're like, we're like archeologists. We want to know what's, what's in the earth. And, and we started the project trying to characterize the living organisms in, in the soil. And we did it in, in our Icon Vineyard, the Adriana Vineyard, in a parcel that ended up uh, being one of our uh, parcel wines. Uh, its name is Mundus Basilus Terra, a very unique name. And what we found in the soil is that some of the bacteria that we identified have never been discovered before anywhere else in the world. Okay, that's one thing. Uh, the other thing is we wanted to know what these guys were doing in the soil because we think that nature knows its way to survive. So if we can understand how nature thinks, uh, we might apply some of these concepts to our decisions in, in, the, in the farming of, uh, of grapes. And uh, what we found is that these bacteria have an activity called PGPR bacteria, a plant growth promoting rhizobacteria. Basically what they do is they help the vines, they coexist with the, with the roots of the vines and reduce the water consumption. And that's amazing. They, they make it more efficient. And on the other hand, they act as a, as a natural vaccine. Uh, they help the vines increase uh, the level of certain compounds in their structure. So they're more resistant uh, naturally to um, um, fungal diseases. Based on these findings, we decided many years ago to uh, transition to organic farming our entire vineyard and, and Adriana Vineyard is now organically certified. Uh, so, okay, no, no bees and, and no zebras, that little uh, microbes living in the soil are very important to us. And regarding carbon sequestration, I think that's a, a great topic. I like, um, I've been having some conversations with a colleague from Portugal indeed. Um, and we were looking at the statistics regarding CO2 emissions um, by industry. And I don't know, it, it could be a really good thing, but we could also partner up with other industries that are making a huge contribution to CO2 emissions. So I think maybe the, the wine industry could, could play an even bigger role than sequestering the CO2 in the wineries. Uh, I would like to see the, the big picture of this. Uh, I, I don't fully understand it uh, yet, but I think it's a good way to go. Yeah, I saw some quite impressive demonstrations. Um, uh, Torres had a conference um, in Villafranca uh, a year and a half ago, and they had people with the technology for this sequestration. The, the issue, I think, is, is that you know you're fermenting wine for three weeks a year, and you've got some very expensive kit that basically is only being used for three weeks a year. Which I think is one of the problems with wineries generally is that you've got lots of expensive real estate and expensive kit that gets used for a relatively short time each year. It's not like brewers. Brewers, you can have a tiny brewery and put out lots of beer. But with a winery, I guess one of the problems is that, that most of the activity is happening over a very short space and time. But it's, I think what's really encouraging from my perspective is how many people are not just talking about all these issues, especially the changing attitudes to the vineyard, I think is really exciting to see. And it's over a relatively short space and time. And, and I guess that the climate change is one prompt, you know, because pe people have got to get smarter. I guess one concern though, is that with all this uncertainty, um, it's going to get more expensive to, to make wine. Um, would you agree? Yeah, I'll take a stab at that. Um, it, it is, I mean, without question, we, we saw in the last couple of years prior to, to COVID-19, you know, every facet of our business was, was going up, right? So we had labor issues because of unemployment. Um, we also had uh, wood shortages because of the fires that happened and the amount of wood that needed to be um, done for building new homes. So pallets were, were affected. Uh, glass, of course, has always been, you know, continue to be an issue. And so 
It is. It's continuing to be more expensive. So how do we as an industry start looking at ways to cut back on what we need? And, and you look at mechanization being one of them specifically in the vineyard. Uh, and there's wineries here doing trials uh, using machines to actually plant vineyards now. So we're continuing not just looking at from the winery side, but what do we, what do we, what kind of quality can we be getting from mechanically harvested fruit and whatnot? And it's, it's really become um, some of our areas where maybe they were against it before. Boy, the technology now, I mean, it's kind of preferred in some areas. So, you know, trying to combat some things that rise and then using some others to help reduce your cost. So, um, Fernando, what, you know, with all the research that you're, um, you're involved with, with Catena, um, what would you say is, has made the, the biggest impact on what you're actually doing as a winery now, um, and not just at the very high end, but across the, broad, uh, the board with your portfolio of wines? And that's a great question. Um... <laughs> I would say that one of the things, uh, at least from the Catena Institute perspective, is that, of course, uh, we're a team of, of scientists. We work with scientists um, around the world. And these collaborations with some scientists from other parts of the world have been very, very beneficial. For instance, we are now uh, um, um, a member of a project named uh, Septentrium. Septentrium project is a collaboration between uh, the University of Burgundy and the Catena Institute. And we're looking at what's happening with two varieties, Chardonnay and Pinot Noir, worldwide. So there are certain trials uh, in Burgundy, Champagne, in the US, Italy, France, Germany, and Argentina. And at the same time, we've created a network of, of uh, different people in different countries that are facing different problems. Some of them are facing the problems that we are going to be facing tomorrow. And we are facing some of the problem that they are facing uh, maybe um, in a year or two. Um, so because it's a very uncertain um, situation, I think the most important thing that we have created is this worldwide network of people that we can go to if we need. And at the same time, because we publish everything that, that we uh, uh, obtain, every, every result that we obtain in our projects is published in scientific journals. So that on one hand is validated by, by, by the scientific community, but on the other hand is available to everyone, to, to Corey, Simon, you. I think that's created a sense of um, ownership in terms of the challenge. We all have this challenge. And we're part of this network and, and, uh, and we have to face it together. So I'm not sure if one result has changed the entire portfolio of the Catena family. I think this network is helping us to do it every day for everyone. Um, we just had a question on the chat. Um, I think this is direct. Um, uh, uh, you, Corey, because it's a, it was a question from Vino Girl, and she says, machine harvesting cuts down on labor, but what about the carbon footprint? Yeah, great question. I saw that. Um, well, if you think about a lot of the vineyards as well, even when you are using manual labor to pick, you still have a tractor going through the vineyard to be able to throw grapes in the gondolos and, and the bins. So you're still using, you know, tractors. But one of the things that we are doing, which is wonderful, with this is is that you with the machine harvester you can pick at any time so for example with white grapes we pick early late night early morning bring them in nice and cold so subsequently we're not using the energy in the winery to cool them down and then on the flip side to bring in red grapes late season and want them warmer, we start picking in the afternoon, bringing them in at a desired temperature. Hence, we're not having to use energy to heat them up. So, I mean, it's, it's actually a, a benefit in the winery as well, where we see a lot of, you know, less energy used during harvest. Yeah, I guess with this, like every viticultural decision, there's no perfect way of doing things. And it's almost like a weighing up. It's like, 
I want to reduce my carbon footprint, um, but I want to preserve my soils. So I might have to go and not use herbicide and, and cultivate manually, but obviously then that's, that's got a carbon footprint associated with it. And so all these, I guess all these decisions, it's like you're thinking, um, you've got all these things, you weigh them up and then you think, well, on the balance, I think this has got to be the best way to, to farm, uh, rather than having a, a template and just applying it like a recipe, um, taking from one region to another region where maybe it doesn't work. And so I guess that's, that's the, the, the issue. I'm aware that we're running, um, running towards the end of our time. So if any of you got anything you'd like to add to the discussion, um, now's your chance. Um, maybe I would like to uh, thank uh, Cristina and Marta from the Port of Protocol for putting uh, these talks together. It, it helps a lot. It's re they're very enriching uh, for us. Um, just today, we're, we're talking from two different regions, uh, three different regions, three different uh, problems. Uh, but at the same time, we all share the same passion. We want to keep making wine for you know, 100 years, 200 years, um, maybe, of course, more. Uh, so thank you for this initiative. And um, we're looking forward to the next step of this initiative that I think is to uh, maybe make small commitments that have a huge impact. Yeah, I would like to, um, well said, Fernando. Christina and Marta, thank you as well. And my good friend, Robin Lale, uh, here in California for getting this, um, getting me on involved in this. And I think in a world where we have, um, you know, politics sometimes kind of uh, takes the forefront, uh, things like this, where we can all come together and look at the big picture and doing what's right for our communities uh, and, our, and our businesses is pretty powerful. So it's much appreciated. Thank you very much. Yep. Jamie, Simon, anything else? Yeah, thanks, Marta. Yeah, I think, um, you know, we, we try to find solutions to some of the big problems, but also we get directed by our customers, big and small, and uh, they push us in a direction as well. And uh, so it's not only our responsibility, but everyone's responsibility out there to ensure that there's the right kind of change. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much all. I can see the passion in all of you. And trying to summarize everything that's been said besides the passion. First, I'll start using your expression, uh, Jamie, that I cry, cry, quite agree with. We, are, uh, we have climate chaos and it's so good. And again, using now, using Corey's words that there are so many players, as you see, as you, it is your experience in California, Corey, that the industry is coming together and big players are doing the right th thing and all the others are coming along. It's wonderful to see that all of you in very different ways are working on biodiversity. It was so amazing to listen to Fernando talk about bacteria, to listen to Simon talk about uh, chameleons and wildlife and Corey talking about bees. I mean, each adapting to your way of doing things, trying to do the right thing. I think you all, at the end of the day, use nature in technology in different uh, ways, so to speak, according to the way you work in your own vineyard. Uh, Fernando, you focused a lot how you have to study before starting to do new things how much science you come from an institute anyway, that makes all the sense. And I have to steal from you, I don't know if we can, this um, worldwide network of people, because I think that's very much what we want to do at Porto Protocol. So I'm gonna have to coach you on that many times. Uh, I, so I don't know <laughs> if you have uh, that uh, claim, but it's really a, a great one. Um, Corey, you spoke a lot on precision viticulture and on MBR that you're, uh, that you're using in the vineyards. Simon, you use a beautiful expression as well. And I think we sense that not only in this talk, but the first time we spoke to you, how everything is a web of, uh, it's not just one solution or the other, it's a web of things. And I reckon that's the way nature works as well. And that's how you, you sense it's 
maybe there's a contrast and please don't get me wrong how Fernando is on one extreme with pure science and there's a some something like intuition coming from from the other side of the world there's a, a balance here on how things are done um, and you touched uh, issues that we we'd love to have solutions from either you here on this round table or from any member we'd love to have solutions regarding carbon dioxide for example dry farming tillage that's actually uh, some of the issues that came already from the other talk as well so we'd love to hear solutions that are being implemented from our members around the world or from any other company that wants to join Porto Protocol, we'd love to hear because we understand that this is one of the challenges that is being faced or that companies are looking for. Um, I don't know if there's anything. Another thing that uh, that Jamie said that's quite interesting is again, this issue of water that always comes up. And uh, as you were saying from your experience in New Zealand, Jamie, if are we irrigating too much? And I think that's a question that probably every vineyard has probably in different, again, we're not always, always all facing the, the water problem that we do have to ask ourselves as a, as a producer. There was much more. Uh, I think, I thank you a lot. I think this was enriching uh, content that we had here. And this is exactly what Porto Protocol is about, is companies from every part of the world learning from each other. I do hope you felt that. Let me talk also about, so today we spoke about uh, in, indirectly, indirectly, about nature-based solutions and technology being used uh, to build a climate response in wines and vines. Next week, we'll have a completely different topic. We'll have, um, we'll be talking with members or family members from new generations working with their, in their family wine businesses and how they're bringing a new sustainable breathe into that business. So thank you all once again. Thank you for being a part of this project. And we hope to see you next week. And all of you on the other side of the screen, thank you for joining us. And we leave you here. Bye-bye. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you all.